look again to our Word Up Bible study. How is everybody doing? I am excited about uh, this Lenten season. Every time I start thinking about the sacrifice and death and burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it sends this strength through my soul. <laughs> you know, I, as, as everybody, I've been going through battles. And as you go through those battles, you find yourself where you need something to lean on. And man, there is nothing as great as the cross, the effects of the cross, and what Christ did for us. That's why tonight's Bible study you do not want to miss, because we're, we're going to be dealing with some areas that emphasize the cross and the burial of Jesus and who Jesus Christ is. But before we do anything, I want you right now to make sure you do as we always do when we get into these Bible studies. And that is understand there's nothing more important in your life, nothing else that can save you other than getting the word of God. I know you believe that. So it's been a long week. It's been a tough week. The last couple of weeks, uh, I did tell you last time I had just come back from Florida. You know the craziest thing of coming back from vacation is jumping back into work. And when you jump back into work, uh, you go head on into some things that were there. But I still was refreshed. And everything's good. Come on, let's look to the Lord. Remember, our topic still, this series is called Before You Give Up. Find somebody. Let them know there's a whole lot you can do. The Bible is talking about before you give up. So let's pray. Father God, again, you have been faithful. Uh, your kindness has kept us and kept you caring about us even when we were not in the most lovable moods. Father, we are so glad that your, uh, us being in your family is not contingent upon our actions or contingent upon what we do, but it's contingent upon what you've already done. How intelligent, how awesome that you would make sure salvation was in your hands because that's how much you loved us. Father, if there's someone out there who's struggling or someone going through something right now, I need you to bless them to know that the word is their answer. And we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to grab your Bibles. And uh, I'm going to have a little explanation. We're going to read from the book of Colossians. Go to the book of Colossians. It's a great book. New Testament. One of the prison epistles. And Colossians has a lot to say. It gives one of the most panoramic views of the sacrifice of God. It talks about the doctrine of Christology better than any other book in the New Testament. It's a small book, but it's a powerful book. And it's going to tie us into our next fight that we have against unbelief. So let's talk about it. In Colossians, I'm going to read from verse 9 through 12. Follow me, 9 through 12. Are you there? Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 12. Listen to the richness of Paul's words to the brethren in Colossae. Verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make, re make requests for you that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. To walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory, unto all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks unto the Father who made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Uh, I might as well read one more verse. Who delivered us out of the power of darkness. Someone say past tense. Has delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son of his love. So what are we talking about here? And what is Colossians trying to make us understand? Well, we're talking about, again, before you give up, our thesis has been based on Mark chapter 9 about the father who had a son who was demon-possessed. He asked Jesus' disciples 
to actually remove the demon, and they could not. We know that part. It was heartbreaking because he said, I've seen these disciples, but they could not. And then we found out that uh, when Jesus came down from being transfigured, they ran to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, how long has this been on your son? And he said, from a boy. And watch this, verse 23 and 24 is where we get our thought from. Because Jesus then said, um, he's, the father then said to Jesus, um, can you help me? Can you do anything? Jesus said, can I do anything? Like taking offense. He said, all things are possible to those that believe. That should hit you right there. All things are possible to those that believe. We're not talking about some outside possibility thinking, some, you know, thinking something into existence. We're talking about the word of God where the blood of Jesus has been shed so that everything that happens supernaturally in the word is something that we are the beneficiaries of. You know, God's a sacrifice of his son. And, and we know where I'm talking a lot about this because we're heading toward Easter. But we have to understand the foundation of us saying all things is the fact that God made a way for all things to happen because nothing is impossible with God. But then in verse 24, the, the father answered Jesus and said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. That's what we looked at. This father said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And he did not give up. Somewhere along the line, in this mix, we've been talking about that there is a spirit of unbelief that can destroy not only your walk in God, it can make you weak, it can make you feel like giving up because you don't realize that when I don't have faith in God, it's unbelief running my life. So we talked about this uh, in our introduction that this father opened up for us Something we found out that all sin is based in unbelief. I don't have time to go over that. Please go back and look at the previous messages. But belief in God's word is actually belief in God. My question to you is, I know you're going through something, but do you believe in God? So what we did, we tackled first week that spirit of unbelief. How do I not give up? I, I battle that spirit of unbelief. I can't find myself to the point where I'm, I'm weak and I'm crying and I'm crushed when something comes on me. I got to battle through that. And the only thing I have to battle with is, guess what? The word of God. So we found out that we found how to battle that spirit. Then last week, interestingly, you got to definitely go back and check this tape. We were talking mental health because all of us know we're living in a time right now and a hard time to be a believer. The world doesn't want Jesus Christ. Society is anti-Christ. If you bring in anything that we talk about that's righteous and how to live right, we are antiquated, we are old-fashioned, we are um, judgmental, uh, we are doing everything wrong because the world just wants to run around without Christ and everything that the world is doing is not working. Come on. You know everything you and I tried before Jesus Christ, no matter what it was, no matter what time, what kind of short-term pleasure it gave, it did not work. So we found out that we're battling now. What are we battling? These opposing forces. I, I said that a believer cannot be possessed, but you can be so... Uh, uh, what is it, harassed and, and burdened and oppressed by a spirit when you let it inside of you that you find yourself weak as if you were depressed. You understand? You're walking around allowing the spirit to dictate when God has all power in his hand. You're sitting there now like there's no way out when God has all power in his hands. You're letting the circumstance or that unbelief you, that you have to battle through anything you get from God. The victory's been won, but we still have to battle through it. So we we're talking about mental health because we said, how do I battle through that spirit when I'm dealing with anxiety, anxiousness? We talked about battling through when our mental health is not right. Please go back and get that. You know, a lot of times we don't want to be frank to understand something. Yes, you're a believer. Yes, you have the word of God. Yes, you have the power of God. 
but you also have an enemy. Somebody write that down. You got an enemy that is trying to stop you from being all you can be. So what happens is we all know we are subject to mental health situations. Um, just like our physical body. I can't say because I'm a believer I'll never get a cold. Some people say that, but that's a lie. I can't say because I'm a believer I shouldn't go get you know, my shots for the virus if I know it's going to help me or a flu shot or take my blood pressure medicine. We wouldn't even think of that. But we don't understand mental health has all kind of pressures on you, supernatural pressures in our mind, the situations we have to deal with. Do you know that uh, it is known that one in four people will have some type of mental health breakdown episode this year? One in every four people will be there. Now, it's not always going to miss you. And I shared with you last week, so go back and get that, because there are some mental health issues. So what we want to talk about this week, we talked about battling the spirit of unbelief, right? We started with the Father, then we talked about battling the spirit of unbelief when I'm un in anxiety. But this week, I want to show you a weapon that's going to affect all of us, that one of your best weapons against unbelief and building up your faith Paul said it to the Colossians. We're going to go back there. But I want you to know our byline for this teaching has been don't give up on anything God has promised. You ought to write this down. Don't give in to the pain of your situation and don't give out. you got to press through no matter what it looks like. I'll say it again. Don't give up. If you're claiming anything God has promised, don't you dare give up. Don't give in because of the pain of your circumstance. Don't give up. Out, meaning don't get so weary that you quit. God has a habit of holding us even when we get weary. So here it is. We're going to talk about battling the spirit of unbelief through patience. Patience. Wow. Waiting. Endurance. Long suffering. Key weapons. In the spiritual battle of victory. Everyone who got a victory was someone who learned, I have to endure some things. I have to wait and it'll come around. I believe God's going to do it. I have to also be long suffering. There's going to be some pain. I'm going to suffer through some things. But I also have to have patience. How many of you know you will admit we are not patient? Now, our patient, I already told you. That one of my pet peeves is driving down the highway and I'm practicing the spirit of patience, getting behind somebody who cannot drive. But God tells us that patience is power. If we can learn to be patient, here's, here's why patience is power. If God promised something and I decide I'm going to be long-suffering and patient in it, then all of a sudden, if that's I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to be patient enough until it comes. That takes away the devil's edge. He has no, he has no recourse against that. Because I made up my mind, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard it rains, no matter how much pain I'm in, I won't give up. And then patience is what keeps me growing in my faith. Go to the Gospel of James with me. I mean, the letter to James. And we'll go back to Colossians. Go to chapter 5 of the letter of James. In there is some powerful stuff on patience, right? And in this letter, if I look at James chapter 5. Okay, the reason I couldn't find it, I'm in Hebrews. Okay. In James 5, if you look at that entire chapter... It's dealing with the power of patience and waiting and what your goal is, right? And then if you look at verse 7, I'll start there. Look what it says. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, now it's talking about a farmer, husband waited for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it. Watch, watch. The farmer is expecting a crop once he plants a seed. God said, once you plant the seed of your, anybody plant a seed of your promise? Yeah, have you asked God for something? Then what is your mind thinking about? Is your mind thinking about the fact that that seed is going to grow into a harvest? Are you sitting there forgetting that you even planted it? 
He said, you got to get the mindset of a farmer to know, since I planted that, I'm going to water it. Something's going to grow. How do I water it? I keep walking around in my faith, right? Husband waited for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it until it received the early and latter rain. So I'm not concerned that it hasn't come up yet. Be ye also patient. Now he's talking to us. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Murmur not, brethren, one against another, that ye be not judged. Behold, the judge standeth before thee. Take, brethren, for example, the suffering and patience of the prophets. Now he's saying, here's some examples. The prophets who spake in the name of the Lord. They were patient speaking because, hear what they mean. When you speak a prophecy, sometimes God has you say stuff that does not fit any kind of reasonable paradigm. It's like, that can't happen. But a prophet that hears God has to, prof has to actually uh, prophesy the future. No one can see it. He's got to do it by faith. And then he's got to wait patiently because sometimes God, not sometimes, God comes in his own time. Somebody need to write that down. God comes in his own time. But can you add to that? He's on the way. I always tell people, when God says, I come in my own time, you still got to know he's on the way. That's a blessing for somebody listening to me right now because it means that what you ask for, if you're going to be patient, here's the promise of patience. I got to get into this. Patience is going to lead you to your blessing. And look what it said. Behold, we call them blessed. Uh, I'm reading the ASV version. That endure. Then he said, how do we know that? Because you've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. Here's what he said. You've seen what Job went through, all of the horror, all of the tragedies, and yet he was patient. God, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, woman, you must be crazy if I'm a curse. You, that's the rain. He, he's raining. He's, he's watering his fruit. He kept his faith in God. Tonight, I just want you to know, get this in your spirit. And if you get this in your spirit, you'll be able to sit through anything, boom, and with power. Because you'll say, I'm waiting patiently. So what we need to know is that spirit of patience is how God's going to bless us. Um, Job persevered to the end. And what we have to look at is in this book of Colossians, uh, let's, let's do a little bit of this. Kind of stay with me because I've been in a couple books, but you need to understand how I'm bringing this out is this way. In Colossians, that passage from 9 to 12, or 13, is one of the most powerful passages, passages of Colossians. So when we look at that passage, we have to understand that Colossians was a prison epistle uh, written by Paul when he was at Rome. As a matter of fact, he was martyred shortly after this Roman imprisonment. He was there for about two years. He had never been to Colossae. Epaphras actually planted the church. Paul was writing to a church he had never gone to. But what's important about this church is that this little church was dealing with, as with several other churches, uh, several churches were dealing with, you know, the Judaism um, versus, you know, that you got to uh, live by the law versus salvation through Jesus Christ. But this church even had a deeper connotation. It was into Gnosticism. It was into mysticism. It was mixing all of these things together. And Paul had to write this letter. And how he resolved that is to show them the superiority. To show them the, um, the deity, the divinity, the power, um, who Christ was. And he lays out, as I said earlier, this beautiful passage on Christology that gives you a picture of the whole salvation plan. And what Christ can do and how Christ stands alone and there's no other name. This, power, this passage is so powerful and beautiful in the wording that it gives us about Christ. But in that first chapter... You know, when you, when you start off, it talks about, you know, who Christ was and, and, and Paul was praying for them, the verses that precede verse 9. And he said, and I pray for you that you have this. Well, I pray for you that you have that, right? And he, and he talks about that. But in verse 9, let's look at verse 9 again. Verse 9 of Colossians. I'm making you work tonight. So we go to chapter 1. 
of Colossians. Just, just listen to this for a moment. Chapter 1 of Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, through the will of God, verse 1, Timothy, our brethren, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ that are at Colossae. That greeting is kind of funny because it's got a dichotomy. He says to the saints and the faithful brethren. Well, aren't the faithful brethren saints? Yes, but what he was saying is there are saints there, but there's some of you who have fallen for the doctrine or the false doctrine of the Judaizers and the Gnostics and all those who were speaking anything other than Christ. Some of you are believers, but they still want you to get circumcised, not knowing that the Bible tells us that we don't need circumcision in our flesh. The circumcision is on our heart, where the word of God has changed us. So look what he said. Faithful brother. Do you know there's always faithful? You know, all of us are saved. And you know, there was something that an old lady used to say when I was in church. She said, yeah, but he's saved, saved. It means that there's a few of us still walking the edge. But there's some of us that say, for God I live and for God I die. They look at you as saved, saved. I don't know about you, but I'm saved, saved. Meaning, I don't have any other recourse. I'm not going any other direction because of Christ. But look what he said. Faithful brother in it, Colossae. Grace be to you in peace. Look at verse 3. We give thanks to God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. We heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love you have toward the saints because of the hope which is laid up in you in the heavens, meaning you believe in heaven, whereof you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. You heard about it by the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you, even as it is also in the world, bearing fruit in you and increasing as it doth also. Since the day you heard it and knew of the grace of God, even as you learn of Epaphras, which I told you planted the church, our beloved fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who has also declared unto us your love in the spirit. Verse 9 starts our passage. Those I said three verses before. For this cause, stop. The main book, part of the book of Colossians, the main point of the book of of Colossians is to show the deity, the superiority, to show who Christ is, that Christ is God. To declare there is nothing on earth. He's before all things, after all things. So the main point is to teach you how to live trusting and believing in God and God alone because you understand who Christ is and what he did. It should make your stand easier. And so in this verse, he lays out this principle that I'm talking to you about. And that is how you battle through your unbelief with patience. Look what he said. For this cause, for this reason, all those things you've been doing. You've been faithful. Uh, you've been growing. And the fruit has been increasing in you. You've been walking in God. He says, since we heard of it, we do not cease to pray and make requests of you that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants you filled with the word of God. He said, also to walk worthy of the Lord, unto pleasing, bearing fruit, every good work, strengthened with all power, according to the might of his glory. And here is how you do it, unto patience and long-suffering with joy. That's what I'm teaching. That's what God wants you to know. Yes, you're in a trial. It's nothing for you to sit in a trial crying, not believing, feeling threatened, feeling defeated. But if you're sitting patiently and a patient person says, I know my God is working it out. Think about the things you have patience about. You got to have patience on something that you want to receive. He said, but in order to do that, you have to be patient and long-suffering. you got to know the power for battling unbelief is the enemy cannot pull a patient person away from God. I'm waiting no matter what anybody else says. Come on, join with me tonight. I'm waiting no matter how I feel. Lift your hand and praise him and join with me. I'm waiting no matter what the enemy's whispering in my ear. I'm waiting no matter how long I had to wait. I'm waiting, and when I'm patient, it means God can provide what I need. And that's what this power of Colossians tells us, that we battle through 
the spirit of with patience. Unbelief is anchored in impatience. I prayed and nothing happened. I asked God and I haven't received it. You're more patient with earthly things than you are with God. Somebody waiting on their social security to come in or your pension check to come in. If it doesn't hit a certain time, you don't just give up and say, oh, my check's not coming. You wait. Maybe you'll get on the phone and call. Has there been a delay? But you wait for it because in your mind, that check's coming through. You may even go out and predict, I'm going to buy this on Tuesday because my check's going to be here. How come you can't be as faithful to God? I, you need to know that patience means it, it's a virtue that's seen throughout the Bible that will help you know the people who usually fail are those who are impatient. Man, am I talking to myself. I got to learn patience. And the Bible tells us that we don't have patience. We miss some of our blessings. One of the most powerful passages is in Luke 21, verse 19, where God declares, In patience possess ye your souls. Uh, this Patience is that weapon. Remember the story of the unjust judge and the widow who kept coming to the judge and wasn't going to quit. And this judge didn't fear God nor man, but because of this widow's much coming and steady believing and steady patient endurance, you will give me, you will have, I will have justice, I will get. She was just very patient day after day. I said this before, he showed up at his job, showed up at his house. Showed up early in the morning. He was going to Dunkin' Donuts. There sat the widow, letting the judge know. I'm, he said, this woman's going to drive me crazy. I better give her what she needs. And all Jesus was emphasizing by that parable was this verse in that text. He said, in patience possess ye your soul. What does that mean? By patiently enduring all afflictions. Oh, grab this. Grab this. By patiently enduring afflictions indignities, persecutions. If you cannot be disturbed or distressed while you're waiting in faith. Yeah, it hurts. Yes, it's painful. But if you can learn to wait and put your mind, put your soul in your mind, this person, you, you gain your soul or your mind. You gain control over all your emotions by learning how to be patient in the most horrible situations. You now are back in control. And what that word means is it's a possessing of. It's not the word like I possess it, own it. It's a word that says I am acquiring it. As, as I'm patient, I acquire more joy. Hallelujah. As I'm patient, I acquire more strength. As I'm patient, I acquire more faith. As I, I don't let myself get upset. I'm not anxious, not running around half crazy. I'm believing in what God said. And I've seen this work. If anybody in here is married, anybody listening to me is married, you need to know one thing. And that is you need to be patient in order to stay married. I won't even say married. You need to be patient to stay in a situation. I mean, a relationship. Because all of us have our own little quirks, and, you know, our own, you know, things that we do. And while we're in that relationship, that can drive the pride. I know you love them. I know, love, hallelujah, kiss, kiss, all that. They will drive you crazy if you can't be patient in some situations. Like when it's time to leave, are you ready to leave? Well, you don't have to say that. So now, if I got to say, are you ready eight times? I'm learning to be patient. Got my little phone, sit down, watch some sports, read me a couple scriptures, and I don't let myself get into the car all, you know, distressed and angry and mess up the dead. Patience is powerful. Look at it in Romans 2 and 7. To them who by patience and continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. In this text, it's, you know, the book of Romans exposes when man tried to live, tries to live without God. I, I can't even talk about the depth 
of this text. You know, Romans 1 and 2 are powerful chapters. But this verse is talking about hypocrisy. Saying when you're going out there, some of you will go out there and judge how others are living. Or you will sit around. He said, but that won't get you um, what you need from God. That won't get you strength. That won't get you stuff. He said, what you have to do is be one of those. Look at verse 7. Instead of being the person who gets all upset when folk aren't living right, but also are hypocritical because the same thing you're saying about them, you find yourself doing. He said in Romans 7, Romans 2 and 7, here's how you get blessed. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. He said patience is your cure for getting eternal life. Habakkuk 2 and 3 talks about when you, and, and I love this verse, and this is a verse every pastor knows, every church folks, but you should get this in your own heart, but every church should know this, because every church should have a vision, a vision statement, or you should be in the middle of a vision from God. And Habakkuk 2 and 3 says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. There's the word again. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God is saying, now you know, Habakkuk is that verse telling you everything around you is falling apart. But in your mind, your patience is planning on there's an appointed time. Man, that is power. Listen to me, sister. Listen to me, bro. The appointed time is God's time. And God's time is always the best time for your life. It's not something that, you know, God's time. And I know I may not understand it in my flesh. And that's why God is telling me, if I keep that spirit of patience, I will be blessed. Because in order for you to get through things, you really got to learn to be long-suffering. You got to be patient. And you got to grow to the place that I'm patient enough to believe that this too is going to pass. And God's going to bring what he said in an appointed time. So I need to write that down. My appointed time. You have an appointed time. Put it in the chat. Let somebody know. Somebody might be suffering. There's an appointed time for your deliverance. There's an appointed time when God's going to bless your family. There's an appointed time when your child's going to be raised up. There's an appointed time for your healing. But you can't receive it if you're battling through unbelief and you're not patient. Because you better believe the enemy's going to try to take him. I, it, it, it sometimes shocked me, as long as I've been saved, as many trials as I've been through, as many battles as I won. I know I'm not by myself. Sometimes it is so hard for me to hold on. I know somebody said, you should learn how to hold on by now. No, it is why this patience is so powerful, because if I find myself fresh off of victory and something hits me and my flesh lets me down, I got to know that there is a gift of God. A fruit of my spirit called patience. Patience. A woman rushed up to the famed violinist of Fritz Kessler. Fritz Kessler. This woman was at his show. He got done. She ran up to him. And she was overwhelmed and just by everything he had played. She said, oh, I would give my whole life to play the violin like that. And Kessler looked at her and said, I did. Did you get it? This is not easy. I'm not sitting here telling you you're going to listen to a 45, 50 minute Bible study and all of a sudden you're going to walk out patient. No, you're going to have to fight for this thing. That's why it's called a battle. You're going to have to tell yourself, I must be patient. Everything inside of you is trying to fall apart. You ever been there? Everything inside of you is negative, telling you it's not going to work. Everything inside is trying to forecast doom in your life. And God wants you to sit there, not just sit there and patient like holding on and grunting. He wants you to have joy. Joy comes when my patience is based on Jesus Christ. So you got to know when, when God says, I'm going to go back to Colossians because that's, that's what we're basing this on. And I want you to see, go back to that first chapter, and I started with the ninth verse, right? Look what he said, for this cause, right? We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make requests for you that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual blessing to walk worthy. But here's the part I want you to see in verse 11. Strengthen 
with all power according to the might of his glory. Who are we talking about? God's glory. God's might and power will come and strengthen us if we are patient enough to access it. Strengthen with all power according to the might of his glory unto, here it is, how do I do it? Patience and long suffering. Now, with joy. I don't want to leave that out. God expects you to have joy. Somebody ought to shout right now. In your worst condition, you ought to have joy. You ought to practice having joy. You will confound the enemy. You will line your spirit up with your soul. You will make your flesh get in line when you practice having joy in what looks like a losing situation. Patience will grow in you and you'll find yourself strengthened by God's might and power. How come? Verse 11, giving thanks unto the Father who made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Those of us who are born again. So what is this joy thing about? Am I just sitting down, just smiling, you know, making myself happy? Bible says smile. No, you smile and give thanks to God. I'm going to tell somebody something. You ought to thank God right now because it could have been worse. Not, not, not only that, thank God because somebody else has it worse. Thank God because of the times he delivered you out of worse. Thank God because he put you together to a point that you can stand through this trial and get through it. There's some folks who are going, not only going through things that are many, many times worse than you, God has protected you, loved you, and cared for you even while you were going through. So what my patience is about, my patience is about thanking God that I even have patience. I'm thanking God that I'm, you know, think about this. I'm sitting here in the flesh, in a world where things around me, bills, health, things look like, you know, the things that, you know, uh, two and two is four, four and four is eight. But the Bible wants me to believe that even though the enemy say two and two, this is what's going to happen. The Bible wants you to stand there and say, no, my God just threw in some new math. Two and two is going to turn out for my better. It's not going to equal what you think it is. I believe, no matter how bad my situation is, that what's going to come out of my situation is going to be my need met. How do I do that? By patience. So if you learn patience, you'll be able to stand. There's a Greek word. Hupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E, which is a compound word made up of two words. Watch this. Hupo, which means under. I'm under something. I'm under pressure. I'm under the gun. I'm under a trial. And monia, a verb meaning to remain and abide. The idea is to remain and abide in difficult situations and circumstances that seem like it's impossible to avoid, but to know I will escape. But the key is I have to remain under. So I can't be squirming trying to make it end because I want it to end. I got to be praying with joyfulness. Oh, I'm helping somebody right now. Thank you. I want you to thank God right now for whatever it is that's causing you to cry. I want you to thank God right now for whatever it is that's tearing your life up. Maybe something attacked your children. Maybe something attacked you at work. Maybe your money's gone. Maybe you've been under such pressure financially. Maybe your relationships. I don't know what it is, but I want you to thank God. And I want you to ask God, give me some patience, God. Give me the patience. I will, I will live through the situations with patience and long suffering. I'll make sure that I understand something that my temperature will not rise. I will keep my temper under control so that I can find myself in a place where I'm long, set, set, long suffering and enduring. Patience. Wow, that'll set you free. Let me give you several reasons for why patience is a weapon. The first one is, write this down, the devil has no defense against patience. Watch this. We, we look at this verse and we don't use it like this, but James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Listen to it again. 
submit. What did I just do? I gave God every bit of my pain, every one of my tears, every one of my doubts. I submitted that to God. And when the enemy came, I resisted going backwards. I resisted falling apart. I resisted breaking down. How did I do it? Because at the outset of this trial, I took the stance of patience with joyfulness. I know by faith my God is going to do it. Look what happens once I submit and resist. It says the devil has to flee from you. Isn't that something? The devil, has, he, he can keep coming if you languish around and, you know, I don't know why this hasn't happened yet and I don't know what's going on. He'll, he'll never leave. But if you were patient and he, when it looks like it's impossible, you stay with what God said. There's going to be a blessing in your life. Here's another one. It will, uh, patience is a sign of maturity. Write it down. Galatians 5, 21. Look at this. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it goes into, of course, the fruit of the Spirit, which is a sign of maturity. When your life, your walk, your journey with God starts yielding, like there's a so forgiveness uh, starts yielding this long suffering, start yielding higher faith, start yielding, you know, what the Bible says is a fruit. It shows that you're maturing. You're not the same whiny baby that got saved before. And devil, you can't attack me with the same little stuff you got last time because I've grown. Thirdly, how's the weapon? It's a sign that my faith is alive. I want you to listen to this one. Luke 8 and 15. But that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Luke 8 and 15. I know it started in the middle with a conjunction, but you need to know how this ties together. He's talking about the people who are standing on good ground in this walk. Uh, it says, but that on good ground are they, you're standing on good ground, which in an honest, good heart, you heard the word, you keep it, and you bring forth fruit. How? With patience. This is redundant. Our, our flesh doesn't even know what the word patience means. Our flesh is so contrary. You know what I mean? We can be patient. Try to, we want people to be patient with us, and sometimes we're not patient with them. There's a story going that says an old preacher actually saw this man who was outside, hungry, walking around, look homeless. He invited him in for a meal, uh, gave him some clean clothes, let him take a shower, set a meal before him, and the man started eating without saying a blessing. And the, the preacher said, don't you believe in God? All this stuff that I just did, I did because I'm a servant of God. Don't you believe in God? The man said, I don't believe in no God. I believe in fire. I believe in, I, I believe in what I believe in. No. And he kept eating. And the preacher said, look, take your food. You got to go. I don't have this in my house. There it is, right? I don't have this in my house. Story goes that God showed up and said, hey, where is that man I led to your house for you to, you know, feed and stuff? I think tonight was the night he was going to receive me. And the old preacher said, well, he didn't say his blessing, so I put him out. And God said, mm, mm, mm. I've been putting up with that old man for 80 years, and he has not had faith in me. And you couldn't even put up with him for one night. We're patient when it comes to our stuff. But if, we'd, if he'd have been a little bit more patient, someone else could have come to the Lord. The point I'm making is patience is not within us if we don't practice it. We got to start thinking. God is long-suffering toward me. God is patient toward me. I need to be patient toward somebody else. Here's another reason this weapon. It will cause you to inherit the promises of God. Write it down. And we desire 
that, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. And we desire that every one of you do, this, do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the, pro the promises. God is saying, as you know, this Hebrews is the faith book. God has given many examples of those who are faithful and those who are not. He said, and we desire that every one of you show the same diligence of those who had faith and hope to the end. Faith and hope to the end. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You inherit the promises by faith, battle and belief, and patience. You can't get a promise by halfway believing. It's through battling through faith and patience that the promise come. Whichever way you have to battle in patience, the main point is that you battle unbelief because impatience will open up a door for unbelief. As soon as you get impatient, you open a door for the enemy to come. Impatience will cause you to do the following things. Write this down. It's so important. You lose your inheritance and change your destiny. Children of Israel, great example. They lost the inheritance of the promised land. They lost or they changed their destiny, where they should have been. Because at a time they should have been patient and believing God. All they did was complain. All they did was threaten. All they did is remind God of what he wasn't. Do you know sometimes you're reminding God of what your unbelief in you is speaking, saying, God, you're not able. God, you can't do this. I know the Bible says you can do anything, but look what's going on with my children. Look what's going on in my life. My help. What you're saying to God, if you get through what you think you're verbalizing, what you're saying to God is, God, I really don't believe in you. Yes, I go to church and I'm religious. But I don't believe you can do this. I know you never said that out of your mouth, but that's what you're saying through your unbelief. You're telling God it won't happen. And know what happens when that happens? You lose your destiny. You, excuse me, you change your destiny and you lose your inheritance. God can't give an inheritance to someone who puts on a temper tantrum and runs away. He could only give it to those who wait patiently by faith. Um, when you try to plan things your way and not God's way, then you start bailing out right in the middle of your trial. You give up right in the middle of your trial. Um, I, I've already talked about Job's wife, but it's a reticent example that comes to mind that, and you know, and I can't blame her. She said, I have seen enough. I've had enough. You sit there if you want to. We done lost our kids. We done lost our house. We done lost our cars. We done lost our service. We done lost our money. Now you're losing your health. Haven't you had enough? Curse your God and die. Because frustration, if you're not patient, it'll make you bail out just as you're about to get your miracle. Don't bail out. Don't give in. You're about to get the miracle, but you have to trust and believe God. Uh, impatient also, watch this, makes you, I call them counter moves. God wants you to move this way, but God's way involves some suffering, uh, some displeasure. Uh, me to act the way I don't feel like acting. You know, I got to humble myself and apologize. I don't apologize to nobody. I have to admit it was my pride. No. So what happens? God said, look, I can bring you back. If you're just patient, I can fix it. But you make counter moves. No, I'm going to do this, God. I'm going to get that other job, get my self-respect. And then all of a sudden, they'll want me back. And God's sitting there saying, you're trying to make counter moves, but I'm trying to direct your footsteps. And you, the only reason you're doing that is because of your unbelief in me and because you're not patient enough to receive the blessing that I'm giving you. And the blessing comes when you trust God and believe that what he says he can do. 
Ecclesiastes 7, 8, and 9. The end of a matter, I love this verse. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. God is saying, be patient. Let me, let me, let's, let's go back to Colossians as we close tonight. Watch this. Hope, you, hope you've been following me as we go through. We're still talking about that father having enough sense to say, look, my child is demon possessed. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And we started tackling the spirit of unbelief, that sin. No matter what you tell me, the reason you haven't gotten what you got, because you just let unbelief come in. And when unbelief comes in, it creates all kind of other sins in your life. You can mention it, slice it any way you want. Having faith is hard. This whole notion of running around shouting and speaking in tongues and, you know, miracles and shouting, all that's fun. But the real work is can you be patient while God is working in your heart? Can you sit back? Patience equals faith. Patience says, my God not only is on his way, I can't have done even before I thought about it. But that yeah, will do what you want. Say what you want. How many know what I'm talking about? You have had to look the enemy in the face sometimes and say, devil, say what you want. I'm holding on to God. I'm getting through this. And once you do that, there is a blessing that comes. That's why Ecclesiastes says the end of a matter is better than the beginning. Because the beginning does not tell what you're made of. Can you make it to the end? That's where you'll know what you are made of. Look what this verse says that we get in Colossians 1. I love it. If you look at verse 12 and 13. Those are the, now, I've sat around in patience, and now here comes the power. It says, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son, of his love. God's love for me made me no longer subject to the kingdom of darkness. When someone translates something, it makes it clear. It sends it on the right path. Um, I was talking to someone who was speaking to me in Spanish, and they don't speak English very well. But they got this app. You ever seen them on phones now that, you know, you download the app, and I was trying to speak to the lady, and she said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. She didn't even say, wait a minute. She said something in Spanish. Then she held her phone up and said, speak into that. And I spoke into the phone, whatever I was trying to tell her. And then it wrote or translated clearly what I was trying to say. Oh, my God. God said, you are no longer subject to that weak and, 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 those, and the things that the enemy is trying to do in your life. That's not you any longer. That was the old you. You've been translated out of that kingdom. You got light. You got power. You can speak my word and destroy atmospheres. You can destroy things around you. You can speak my word and bless the environment of your house. Speak my word and bless the environment of your body. Speak my word and watch your strength come back through your flesh. Speak my word, but you got to learn how to do it in patience. It doesn't come overnight. He said that you're translated out of that kingdom of darkness. Why are you subject to that, man? Why are you sitting around letting that stuff get to you? And then he said, in verse 13, uh, verse 14, in whom we have the redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Who is the, I know I said I was going to read a few verses, but this stuff is good. You better read it and apply it to you so you can have that, that long suffering and patience that the verse implies. For in him were all things created. Who are we talking about? Verse 16. Jesus Christ in heaven, upon the earth, things invisible, things visible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and unto him. He is before all things, in turn he consists in all things. He is the head of the body of the church, who is being the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it was his good pleasure of the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. I could read on and on, but I hope I'm making the message. Why should I be patient, Pastor? How can I sit patience? Here's how. I got joy because I just thought about it. But I just learned, man, he was before everything. So this thing coming on me, he was before that. This thing I'm dealing with, there's some saints already been through that. He's the head of the body. He's my head. I'm the body of Christ. He has all power. He made everything. Listen, 
If that doesn't make you battle unbelief, then you miss your focus. You battle unbelief by patience. Patience is so cool. You sitting there, you laughing, you got joy. Everything seems like it's falling apart, and you still laughing. And the enemy's wondering, what is wrong with him? I've already made up my mind that it's in patience. I possess my soul. I can't go crazy if my patience is built on Christ. Come on, man. Pass this message to somebody. Watch them start practicing patience, and the enemy have no recourse because you made up your mind. Nothing's going to shake you or move you. God bless you. Share this message with somebody else. Have a blessed night. And remember, start when, start when you hang up. Start practicing patience. Your, your husband, your family, they don't know what happened to you. Start practicing patience and watch God. God bless you. Thank you.